Oh, hello. Didn't see you there or something. Actually, yeah. I know you can't see me and I can't see you, but maybe you're wrong. Maybe I can see you. Maybe I can see you all. All of you jerking your chickens in your Shadow the Hedgehog pajamas. Really don't want to, but I don't have a say in that. Just kidding. I can't see you. Relax. Just don't relax that much. For what I'm about to tell you now may scare you for life. Or maybe just for a few minutes. I guess it's no secret that I'm a 30-year-old virgin living alone on low income. To make matters even worse on my apathetic Sigma male failing lifestyle, I love collecting obscure VHS tapes, especially ones about classic American sitcoms, because they have it all. They have the attitude and charisma we all want to sit down and unwind to after a long day being a bureaucratic slave to the man. With 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 his stupid mansplaining sexist ways, or let's face it, by 2024 standards, his beta-splaining ways, all while my sigma-splaining ways falls into a clusterfuck casserole. Eh, uh, don't worry. Just let me digress. <sighs> you see, sitcoms, I know how cheesy they can be. The predictable delivery, simplistic character concepts and plot lines, the obvious lame attempts to relate with today's youth and boomer or Gen X parents trying to keep up with it all. It's all been done to death like an overcooked squid, <laughs> leaving a putrid fish stench everywhere. And it plays the clarinet too, right? Because it's a squid. Oh, man! <laughs> Like that's any better? Oh yeah, you kids and your mean parody humor is so much more fulfilling. Okay, Boomer. No! Okay, Zoomer! I tell you this, you don't know life until you've seen the genius work that is according to Jim. It's a brilliant, I say brilliant, I say one more time, brilliant sitcom about this alien that crashes on Earth and ends up becoming a part of this family and... Oh, wait. Oh. That's, uh, that, that's actually the, the setup to ALF. Of course. <laughs> See, even to this day after that incident, I still confuse the two. But it's only because for the longest time as a kid growing up, seeing these two shows... I thought that the voice of beloved sitcom icon Alf was none other than the foreshadowing Belushi younger brother, James Belushi. For many, many years I thought this, until I was old enough to use the internet machine without parental supervision. After finding all that out, well, my apathetic life went on like any other. Until one day. Until one day. I stumbled across... The Dark Spider-Man Web, where I found what I thought at the time was a sitcom match made in heaven, baby. Oh, yes. My nipples got so hard. Uh, they haven't lactated since Christmas, but uh, they came pretty close. A VHS from 2001 that read, according to ALF, the most unexpected sitcom clash in American sitcom history? Oh! Uh -huh. It was all written in Sharpie, which was a bonus. I love Sharpie pens. I'm addicted to them. I could smell the lead poisoning through my computer screen. I bought it for 100 bucks. That's right. When I hit the purchase button on the confirmed purchase screen, it sounded as though a deep demonic laughter came from my low receiving speakers. But like sperm dripping down my thigh after happy time, I just shrugged it off. It arrived first thing the next morning. I was ecstatic with excitement. Ecstatic with excitement. Like a depraved hermit with an unhealthy vagisil fetish. Only worse. Yeah, I, I popped the tape in and hit play on my Tickle Me Elmo VCR. And the first thing I heard, I mean heard, 
was the sound of a muffled demonic scream through my naked Cinderella surround sound speakers. <sighs> yes, I know. Maybe if I didn't buy all this random crap, I wouldn't be living paycheck to paycheck. Shut up! Shut up! Let me be happy while being miserable, okay? As I was saying. The show started... The show started with fading into the outside of the home, according to Jim. I guess they were starting there, considering it was from 2001, when the show just launched. Surely Alf was going to launch in with his appearance, later. The episode began with Jim coming home from work. He looked tired. Some might even say, disheveled? He put away his jacket and sat on the family sofa without so much as a meat peep. He shouted from across the room, asking his skinny wife Cheryl for a beer, which almost immediately she retrieved from the fridge to him and walked away without a peep as well, as if she wasn't even supposed to be a part of the scene. Objectifying much, writers? Well, Jim drank the beer and the longest guzzle following a huge obnoxious belch that made the studio audience laugh hysterically. Shut up! Jim shrieked, sounding annoyed and afraid at the same time. The audience roared even more loudly. Shut up, you stupid fudge packers! This made the audience groan and laugh at the same time. I was beyond confused, though. I had no idea where this plot was going to go. <coughs> well, at least I had to believe uh, I had no idea where it was going to go. So I find happiness, you know. I've seen it all. I know how it all goes, you know. We all know how it all goes. We all know how all this crap goes. So I just give up right now. Uh, I'm not just kidding. I'll keep reading. The scene then cuts to the family having a very quiet dinner. I could hear coughing and yawning in the audience as I watched, waiting for something out of the norm to happen, but the family was just having a nice dinner and asking about their days how their days went and actually being rather decent to one another. Huh? <laughs> what the hell is this, I thought. There has to be some alternative motive from all of them. I mean, sitcom characters aren't just nice for no reason. No, there's always some manipulative scheme underneath it all to get what they want out of one another. I mean, they are, after all, the bread and butter of sowing sociopathic individuals within our modern-day society. Finally, something mildly amusing does occur. Andy, the brother-in-law of Jim's, and Dana, the sister-in-law, both reach for the same biscuit in the dish. The audience awakes with short burst of laughter. You go ahead, I'm full, said brother Andy. Thank you, dear brother, replied Dana. What in the actual unholy uterus is this? I said with frustration. Why are the characters acting like this? Jim then looked at Andy and began to nod with approval. Good boy, Andy. That one was close. The audience then began to laugh a little more. And then... Jim slammed his fist on the table and then broke the fourth wall, saying, What the hell are you laughing at, you idiots? You don't even know what you're laughing at, do you? Why can't a man and his family just have a nice dinner and a nice normal day in the world of according to Jim? Because that's not funny. Ow! Oh, well, I'm sorry. Sorry I can't entertain you morons every day of my joke of a life with some spontaneous inspiration to do something pen-headed. Uh, I got a little chilled from that. Oh, I didn't close the window. Never mind. No, still, I was a bit uh, genuinely chilled. It was obvious now. Jim is trapped in this sitcom every day. And considering this was from 2001, it must have only been the first season still. Also, considering the tape had no number, I could only imagine how tiresome it could be if indeed you were 
somebody living in the world of a sitcom as if it were to be your literal life inescapable from its confines. There was an intense moment of silence among the others. The children were completely mute, shaking and trembling with fear. Who gives a shit about them anyway? Cheryl then, soft-spoken in tone, asked Jim, Please sit back down, James. We can still have a nice dinner. But Jim said, I want to know what the hell they think is so tit-flippin' funny! Ah! The audience was about to laugh again, but then hesitated. After a, another brief amount of silence, Andy, perhaps believing he could chin Jim up, foolishly, foolishly says, Maybe they were just expecting me to rip one, old guy. He snickered. Jim slowly turned his head to Andy in a manner suggesting, Don't you dare. But Andy immediately, indeed, let one rip so big and so obnoxiously, childishly loud that as the audience roared with hysteric laughter, the rooftop of the house is shown blowing off into the sky and then landing back upside down at a pathetic eight frames per second. Well, you know the stakes were low for this one, so no surprise the budget was too. The inside of the house looked like it was hit by a hurricane. Jim is seen struggling to get up under a pile of ceramic, half-naked, ugh. I guess he had boxers on still. The fart explosion blew off his clothes. And being the degenerate pervert that I am, I was hoping to see Dana half-naked as well. But of course, they couldn't do that. Both Dana and Cheryl are seen limping out of the kitchen entry. Dana's shoulder is exposed from a torn shirt only, and Cheryl more or less the same. The children just walk up slowly, looking even more unsettled than before. Andy, however, was nowhere to be found. Suddenly, a voice above was heard, and it was none other than the voice of Steve Urkel! Why, hello, Jim family! How nice of you to let me drop in like this! Just kidding! Pretty good, huh? It was... Alf! I didn't know he did Steve Urkel impressions. Who the fudge-packing fart particles are you, and why do you kind of sound like me? Jim said, sweating droplets of blood, and as he stood there so dazed, why, I'm whoever you want me to be. In fact, maybe that's why we sound so alike. Maybe that's why I planted an explosive up your friend's back hole. And maybe you're so sick of living in these confines that you'd rather be in space. I know I'd rather not be. But with a little magic, I can take you there. Surely you don't wish to be stuck in a contract living nightmare where a studio audience laughs at your every waking quirk. Jim was now on the verge of tears. I, I don't want to rely on some cat-eating alien to save me. Alf became furious. How dare you, fat man, fatty patty? I'll have you know in the next 20 years or so, your species will resort to cat and dog eating on a regular basis beginning probably somewhere in Ohio. No, I said. Oh, did I mention the World Trade Center? You ever have World Trade Center crumble crunch? Part of a balanced breakfast? Cereal so underrated, it should have been an act of terror to promote? Stop! Stop predicting events, I shouted. Then... Something happened that sent chills down my chills, down my spine. All of the characters looked right at me. They looked at me very angrily. They started to grow razor-sharp teeth and mutated heads, then razor-sharp claws as the screen turned into a hellish red. I ejaculated, I mean ejected the tape as fast as I could before seeing a sinister smiling Andy jump scare. 
When I pulled out the tape, the sound of their roaring terror was still audible through the magnetic tape. I raced to the kitchen to grab my scissors, but then the scissors grabbed the other pair of scissors and started scissoring. Scissoring! As the tape wrapped itself around both of the scissoring scissors and started flying toward me like a freaking bat. I tried to run for the front door, but it kept blocking every way I faced. As soon as I turned a different direction, it stayed right on me like a target. I decided enough running. Enough running. I grabbed it as it attacked me, cutting through my veins as I tried to pull it apart. I was barely able to separate the scissors and thus rip the tape in half. It chopped off all my fingers, except my right pinky. We all know what I'm going to do with that. Then, before I knew it, it swam up my rectum. And to this day, every time I go number two, I hear the rest of the episode. Trust me, it's not good writing. It's not good writing at all. But according to Jim and Alf are still legendary. Just know that since season one, that is not the original James Belushi. Nope. The end. Your friend, the Orwellian Oreo.